So I have the privilege of sharing uh, whole person care, uh, uh, which I say is like the gospel, okay? The gospel of whole person care. Actually, uh, uh, most of the uh, values uh, within whole person care do come from the gospel, so I'm not ashamed to say it's sharing the gospel. Um, whole person care, uh, when I was at, at medical school, from 68 to 74, whole person care wasn't taught uh, under that banner. And I would say that um, my experience of medical school was that it depended which subject you were learning at the time. And it depended on the person, the teacher, whether they were uh, imbuing whole person care ideas to us or not. Uh, certainly by the end of medical school, I had a strong sense of wanting to um, serve the whole person as a doctor. Um, and, but the whole theory about it and the development of uh, curriculum about it uh, has taken a long time. Um, so uh, when we went to Nepal uh, to start the Department of General Practice in Duran in the eastern side, in um, 19, uh, 2000, sorry, year 2000, uh, we um, were given the task of writing the uh, postgraduate and undergraduate curricula, uh, which was a very exciting and big job in the first year. And we based a lot of it uh, on um, uh, John Murtagh's book. And for example, we turned the uh, all the subjects around the other way instead of pathological diagnosis being the heading uh, we, we taught from symptoms and then derived the differential diagnosis and honed down that way. And this was quite radical in the university. The academic council were concerned about it, but let us go ahead. We're very blessed in their um, willingness to allow us to teach. Um, during our time there, when we were teaching this way, uh, there was a time when a new term came into jargon, uh, particularly from the English, uh, and that was patient-centered care. And just a little while ago, we talked about student-centered care, but patient-centered care uh, was being written about in the BMJ, and we were keen to take it on. And we wanted to uh, get our foot into the early years of the um, undergraduate training. Uh, the the um, disciplines were all competing for attention in that area and general practice was uh, excluded. Uh, our friends in psychiatry were there and they were certainly teaching some of these principles. But the Academic Council rejected uh, patient-centred care as a, um, a term and a concept and said that it didn't belong in the curriculum. So what I was trying to say is that... Um, uh, the um, there is a competition for ideas in the university, and that's a good thing. Uh, and certainly, it, ideas like this, which is sometimes considered a bit soft and woolly, uh, may be um, pushed back by more hard-nosed um, ideas. So, uh, hope, I'm uh, assuming that everybody in the room is an ardent uh, carer of the whole person, uh, that's not in doubt. Now, something that happened to us in Nepal, which was very encouraging, is when John Geeta and the Prime team came to visit. And uh, they particularly uh, worked with our department and the Department of Psychiatry. And this was a great opportunity for our um, postgraduate trainees to get together with the psychiatric trainees and under John's amazing uh, teaching, uh, we explored this whole person care concept in a lot of detail. Um, now, whole person care is one of the, the fundamental topics of PRIME, and I'm going to share my screen to um, uh, show the slides. Can I do the show captions thing so that people can see how that works? Now, everybody can see my screen and perhaps you can 
see me on the side there somewhere. Yeah. Um, now I'm using a set of slides which I've taken from the Prime Hub. It's a hub of resources for teachers uh, that is available to those who are accredited teachers with Prime. So uh, briefly, shall we reflect uh, what does whole person care mean in practice and what are our patients' needs? So this is uh, one aspect of what we're doing today. This, this particular topic, whole person care, tends to focus on the patient. But I would put to you to it that the ideas can also apply to our care of students. So that throughout this, when we're talking about stories, we may remember our interactions with students and how caring for the whole person when it comes to students is just as important. Another thing to think about if we're looking at these two things is that um, whole person care is uh, fundamental of the Saline teaching program. Uh, and we're today we're more focusing on education. So reflecting on the needs of students is very appropriate. So here is a picture. This uh, picture I recognised is from Nepal. It wasn't taken by me. It was, uh, may have been one of John Gita's pictures when he visited. So if you look at closely at the picture, could you think about what is the diagnosis and what's in the minds of the little boy and his father? Is that a question you want us to answer, Owen? I'm giving a moment for people to reflect. So this is just by yourself initially. So can you see, does the picture tell you a story? Uh, and can you hone in on the diagnosis? And you, can you just imagine what it's like for father and son? Okay. Um, now, in the WHO quality of life uh, scale, uh, there this instrument, uh, which they have tested in uh, multiple countries, multiple languages and cultures, have come up with these um, aspects of quality of life, uh, physical, psychological, independence, social relationships, environment and spirituality. So that's a, a framework. I'm going to use another such instrument a bit later called the seven levels. But let's just use this one. Uh, looking at the picture, uh, think about the physical health of father and boy. Uh, think about their psychological state uh, where the uh, disability is um, impairing their ability to function in the community? Is there some handicap? Uh, so going on to social relationships, uh, are they experiencing stigma or other barriers to uh, getting on with life? And as they interact with the environment, uh, what difficulties may they face because of disability? Owen, and sorry. yes, sorry to interrupt. Um, I may have missed it. Um, I, I'm not sure. Can you give us? Would it help to have the diagnosis, or did I miss that? No, I haven't mentioned it yet. Okay, uh, but okay. Uh, I would like some. Uh, uh, perhaps um, somebody in the room could give the diagnosis. I think it would be interesting. <laughs> John, <laughs> your father has Hansen's disease. Yes, 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 that's what it is. You can see the um, uh, the fingers are very distorted on in the man. Yeah, and uh, from a paediatric point of view, can what do you think about the boy? Is there anything there you 
might think of? Well, I was thinking of hypothyroidism, uh, but I don't know. Um, I can see from their dress that they're from the high country. Uh, they're sort of a little bit um, Tibetan looking, aren't they? Uh, the boys say that um, cloak is like that. Hmm. Um, now, what are their spiritual and personal beliefs? Uh, looking at them, I'm guessing that they could be Buddhist. Um, they don't look like Hindus, but that's from the just my impression having lived there. It was interesting, um, uh, Petrina was talking about um, uh, praying for the technology. Well, Hindus pray for technology. They do it in the form of big blobs of tikka. You know, tikka, which they put, put the tikka on the forehead here, uh, but this ad, action, action of um, applying uh, tikka, doing puja uh, to the computers, are they turning the, the computer into a god or are they asking for a blessing on the computer? Anyway, uh, when the new computers arrive, uh, they are blessed with a big lump of red gooey stuff applied to it. That's just a side comment. So we might have some similarities. Oh. Yes, indeed. I think uh, religious behaviour all over the world has much in common. Uh, now, here's a list of uh, things that apply to the uh, picture, uh, to the, um, we can see that the, there may be uh, physically uh, foot pain, numbness, limp or odour. If the man's got a, uh, a leprous foot, he might have all those problems. And certainly his fingers uh, looked as if they were a bit um, damaged to me. And psychologically, uh, he and the son may uh, show some loss of self-esteem and depression and anxiety. Uh, there could be some barriers to work, to transport, finances and medical care, very likely uh, exacerbated by living in a remote place. Uh, certainly people with uh, Hansen's or leprosy uh, in um, Nepal do experience quite a lot of stigma um, and are, are pushed outside the uh, social situation. So does the little boy have any chance to go to school or is he excluded because of the family he belongs to? And what is it like for them? Can they get adequate food? Uh, can they get nutritious food? Is it appropriate food? Uh, clothing. So could they be experiencing some um, sense of hopelessness or loss of self-esteem, purpose. So do they perhaps think they've been cursed by God? Uh, these are all, all the uh, things that we can derive just from that photo. So going on, uh, our job as uh, healers in healing professions is to care for the whole person body, mind, and spirit. And the ribbon here reminds how, how it's a sort of like a, a continuum uh, of these aspects. And here's another picture showing the same thing um, in which uh, uh, our physical body and our spiritual body, the interface is the mind. And actually we are one person. Uh, we're not the dualists uh, that think that um, mind and spirit are uh, body and spirit are completely separated. Uh, we absolutely depend on our bodies uh, for the our spiritual health as well. Um, and uh, we use our minds to bridge the gap between it. And, and this way uh, we seek to connect to God and understand our place uh, in the universe and in the history. Uh, this is a, a mosaic from an early Christian church, apparently, uh, and it shows how the, a continuum of, uh, 
ideas, never-ending interconnection of um, those um, lines. Uh, in another prime series, there's a series of photos, including this one, photos of, of an artist's work who worked in a hospital and depicted um, doctors, students, patients, and the environment. And this is one of the pictures. And when we look at the picture, we may think that um, we can be very focused on what's going on in the body. So with the stethoscope, we concentrate to hear every aspect of the heart sounds and try to work out what's happening with the heart sounds, where the murmur is, uh, try to perhaps diagnose. Uh, these days with echo, we seem to be less concerned about trying to diagnose what murmurs mean. Um, but this uh, uh, concern about getting the physical si symptoms and signs in order can distract us from seeing the person who has those symptoms and signs. And so here's this statement, a doctor can spend all day listening to the heart of a patient, but not a minute listening to the patient's heart. Mm -hmm. So here is a, a statement uh, by a, a British um, leader, I, I think from the uh, National Institute uh, NICE. Um, what most of our patients want. They need us to have high levels of knowledge, uh, to be competent and professional, to be able to diagnose patients' rashes, advocate for, in times of trouble, uh, to be guided by research and study as we stri straddle the twin religions of, um, uh, I can't see, of, the, of art, art and science. But most of all, they want us to care So it's not just a, a nice idea. There's a lot of evidence that backs up this whole person approach. I'm going to show you the video now. Uh, so I'm going back to my share screen to, to start a video by uh, David Chaput, who is uh, um, uh, um, certainly was a very important uh, prime teacher uh, and wrote quite a large book that I've uh, had available to be in Nepal. Um, now I'm going to. Sh I won't. I won't show the whole video. Uh, I'm going to sh show 11 minutes of a 17 minute visit video. And see how it sounds. Right. The sound comes on in a minute. Hello, my name is David Chapu de Santos. I'm a physician and a teacher, and I may work mainly in Eastern Europe. And I'd like to introduce you to a model of medical care. It's the seven level model, and you'll see why in just a moment. Um, first of all, I'd like you to look at this picture. I was walking in France one day in the country, and I saw this uh, apparition at the window, so I waved to her, uh, but she didn't wave back. And the reason is, of course, that she's not real. She's a model. And what I'm going to show you now is just a model of medical care. And it will be abbreviated in many senses. But we have found that this model works well and represents reality well. So I'd like you to see a patient with me. We're going to Belgrade. And it's about seven years ago. And it's a cold, uh, dark day and we walk along the streets into this block of flats and I've been asked to see somebody living on the top floor. We climb up the stairs and it's dark and there's a slight smell of urine and sitting on the stairs there's a young man smoking cigarettes and stubbing them out in a little pot and I go into the room and I open the door and there's the patient. He's about 50 years old and he's very bedraggled and pale, he's slightly sweaty and he's in a dirty uh, white t-shirt uh, hanging off him. He's very thin, he's lost a lot of weight. He's lying on the bed in the sitting room and as I come in he does his best to raise himself up in the bed to greet me and around him are his family. 
looking very nervous, very anxious, and then look to me as I come into the door. And they tell me this story. And the story is, about 18 months ago, he would had a cancer removed from his kidney. And they told him it was successfully removed. And he was well for about nine months. And then things started to go wrong. He began to get cough and breathlessness, increasingly breathless on exertion. That's the first level of the model. You see, our patients don't come to us with diseases. They come with symptoms and with problems. And one difficulty in the uh, education of doctors in many countries, particularly in Eastern Europe, is they know a lot about diseases, but not very much about how to solve patients' problems. And this model is intended to help. So, the level of symptoms. Now, I examined him, and he had a fever. Uh, he had an increased respiratory rate and was clearly not well. This is the second level. This is the level of signs. Now, a sign means something that points. They are pointing to what is happening underneath. They're pointing to the causes. He brought his chest x-ray with him, and this showed many rounded masses, rounded opacities in his chest. This is the, the level of disorders of structure and function. There's a clear disorder of structure here. Um, what do we think is going on? What's the pathology? Well, uh, maybe he had a pneumonia. My guess was that he had secondary cancer, secondary to the primary in his kidney. And that's the level of pathology. Uh, what about the causes? Well, he was certainly a smoker, but the most likely thing was, I think, that he had secondaries. And this is the level of causes. These are five levels at which the disease expresses itself. The disease shows itself. Now, when I was a student, well, that was the end of the matter, basically. Uh, now it's treatment, isn't it? Uh, however, it's not the end of the matter. You see, he was uh, clearly unable to work. He was actually unable to dress himself. He could barely rise from the bed. This is the level of disabilities. But there's more than that. Around his bed uh, were his family, anxious, worried, concerned that he was going to die. She was going to lose her husband. They were going to lose the breadwinner in the family. And this is the level of social effects. These are the seven levels of the seven level model, the levels at which a disease shows itself. You see, a diagnosis isn't just a label stuck on the forehead like hypertension. A diagnosis is what is going on here. Being able to understand and describe what is happening here, what is this all about. So those are the seven levels. And you see the process is a little bit like drilling for oil, isn't it? You can appreciate quite easily what the patient's telling you, uh, the symptoms, the signs, but then after that you rely on x-rays, on shadows, uh, on some pathology, microscopy maybe, and you're, if you like, drilling down to where the oil is. The oil is the causes, because it is those that you aim to prevent, it is those that you aim to treat, it's those you aim to work with where possible. Um, so, I've talked about the diagnostic side of the model, running through the diagnosis. The other side to the model is about treatment. At each of these seven levels, or most of them, there should be some sort of planned therapeutic intervention. So, the most important one, in one sense, is preventing the causes. Uh, you may not be able to do that, and certainly in his case, we couldn't do that. There's no way we could have prevented the causes of his cancer and his secondaries from acting now. Other interventions to reverse the progression of the disease and have it regress. Maybe you can't do that or you'll be only partially successful. Relieve symptoms. I have to say that the standard of symptom care, symptomatic relief, is often extremely poor, particularly in Eastern Europe limit the disability and rehabilitate the patient where possible. So what I'm saying to you is that this is a multidisciplinary 
set of interventions. The primary care physician won't be able to do all these things, and he or she will require the help of other members of the healthcare team. But that wasn't all. I said that he had a cough and was breathless. Something else. Uh, he was very dizzy, and he had tingling in his fingers. His respiratory rate was considerably increased, and he had this tingling all the time, and he said he felt dizzy. So, what do you think was happening? What do you think that might have been? <sighs> Breathing away, fingers feeling quite stiff. I can't keep this up very long. Um, but uh, I thought that he had, clearly on observation, he had an increased respiratory rate, and underneath that, I thought he had a hyperventilation syndrome. He was hyperventilating. That was the disorder of function. What about the pathology? Well, I thought that he had an anxiety state. And why did he have an anxiety state? Well, he was clearly afraid that his cancer had returned. Uh, and I'm afraid he was right. Uh, you see, it's just not a question of making a physical diagnosis. Lots of physical things happening as well. But another part of this patient is involved, and that's his mind. It's not enough to concentrate on the physical dimension. There's a spiritual dimension as well. Uh, sorry, a, a psychological dimension as well. Uh, what's the importance of that? Why should we worry about that? Well, anxious patients suffer more frequent and more severe pain than those who aren't anxious. So it's important to manage their anxiety, to treat their anxiety. Otherwise, their analgesic requirements will be significantly increased. Take a look at this. It wouldn't have been ethical for me to photograph my patient, but he looked like this. This is a picture of an Afghani man with his dying son. I want you just to look at him for a moment. Look at his eyes. What do you see there? What questions is he asking? What's going through his mind? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to my son? What has my son done to deserve this? What hope is there for me? What hope is there for my country? These are the words that my patient spoke when I tried to explain to him what was happening. He said, so I'm finished then. You might be thinking about therapeutic interventions at a physical level, maybe therapeutic interventions at a psychological level. This is another level still, isn't it? We've talked about body, talked about mind, there's another place where hopelessness and despair live, which you saw on the face of that Afghani man and his dying son. And that's the place of the spirit. Spirituality, the spirit requires a little bit of definition. Here is a definition. So a relationship of trust in God or the universe, the cosmos, the ultimate being, whatever it is, which provides a, a basis for hope and meaning in our lives. Uh, so I feel as if I shouldn't interrupt uh, mm -hmm. Professor David, <laughs> but uh, it was an extremely evocative uh, video uh, which I hope um, is also doing something in you right now. Uh, and uh, I, I hope you'll have a, a chance to express it because we're going to break out into pairs. Zoom recording, and I'm going to Brady Bunch it. Okay. Um, so uh, I don't know about you, but I do this every day uh, pretty well subconsciously. So uh, my when I'm listening to a, uh, a case and I'm writing the history down, right, 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 under various headings, 
uh, I don't include all the headings, uh, but we may well imagine that we could have all those headings on our uh, history paper uh, if we um, paid attention to that sort of level of detail. I think we actually, we do it automatically. I'm a bit of a stimulus response person. Somebody tells me a story and then I respond. Uh, and then afterwards I might analyze why I responded in a certain way. Uh, so this exercise today is just to um, get us to th think about thinking and uh, the way we work. Um, I'm hoping now that um, uh, Petrina can invite um, two or three people to tell a story and its analysis uh, pretty briefly so that we can finish within 15 minutes. Okay, so would anyone like to volunteer if you heard a particularly interesting story that may be helpful for the rest of the group to hear about? Maybe three people share, and then we're going to have a five, two minute break and then the next one. So can I invite that as an open question, or do I need to? Can I say something? I'll say something to yes. accept my you know, non doctor band here. Fantastic, good on you. But you know, OT me can't help myself. So, a fascinating story, which I can't tell you because we will still be here well. for dinner time. Um, very complex older lady with lots of things going on for her, um, both medically, um, socially, psychologically, and spiritually. So, it fits in well with your story, Owen. Um, the thing that struck me just from an OT perspective was the impact of the top two things. So the um, disability and the social, my <laughs> potential perspective is that those things were then causing some of the other things in the other five below um, in the kind of complexity of the interaction. So that was just my observation. What Lauren was saying to me about a very complicated situation is that, yeah, so not, I mean, important to acknowledge them, but just that they were actually making those other things worse and causing a spiral down of the function and social um, aspects, as well as everything else. Thank you. You can ask Laura Lane, but you might hit on me now. And, and, and we all know of that situation, isn't it? When certain things and impact on other things, it has a spiral down. Um, you were going to say something? Yes. The story of an uh, elderly gentleman I was seeing. He's 82, uh, unmarried. He decided to retire early and become a sannyasi. But his father, his brother died, so he did. Sannyasi is a hermit. But sadly, he lost his brother and he decided to take care of his wife, brother's wife. And he remained unmarried. The process, he developed diabetes. Lady had advanced Parkinson's, bedridden, so he took care of her till her death. And this gentleman had diabetes. He has lymphedema of both the legs, two legs, unable to walk. He's blind in one eye. This has been there for many years. On top of that, diabetes, chronic renal disease, uh, rate going up to six, heart disease. So one day he asked me a question. He said, why is God allowing all these diseases in one body. There is no part of his body has not been affected. Blind, having lymphedema, he is having kidney problem, he is having heart problem, he has had some skin issues, you know. So that was a very difficult question for me to answer. So I can see all this level, you know. Plus he was lonely because he was alone, he didn't have a family. Uh, there was no one to care for him. There was a caregiver he employed to take care of him. So he could not sleep at night. He was anxious, depressed. So I can see the symptoms, the signs, the structural dysfunction, the pathology. I know the causes. More is the disability and the social effects. Disability of difficulty in mobility. He could not go out because of his lymphedema, because of his breathlessness. He was bound to his home 24 hours. Social effects, lonely, isolated, depressed, no family. 
Thank you. Yeah. So, and, and like that situation, so often many of us see patients like that complex patients. And the part of me that wants to fix them up, we want to fix them up. And sometimes we can't. But if you go back to all the things we've been learning today, actually what they want most is someone to care, to care about. Yeah. I think he just wanted me to be there yeah. every week and just listen to his story. And sometimes even if we can't alleviate this, that's... I don't know. I was just saying that that parallels... Do you want to share your story? Then that'll be the last story. I just very much with ultimate fatigue. I'm actually in a better care environment in a spiritual areas, but it's nursing areas. Um, but the disability was still relatively comfortable. So Yeah, um, Emily, knees. speak louder. Hmm. Sorry, she had three nieces who were her own family, and the complexity was that they couldn't agree amongst themselves how to what to do with their aunt. Um, so Rosemary was struggling least with the patient. Most with parents trying to get some agreement of the way forward. And I think it was even more confounded, it's not so that she was a JW, uh, not sort of ethical. So there was a spiritual hope element. She, spiritual parents could work. So I think from the model again, this dysfunction was gradual to find a real complex thing. Um, is is that enough, Owen? I people can talk yeah. forever, but I'm that's right. Fine. Do you want to take over? Yes, please. Uh, so I'm just going to round this off. Um, uh, there is many things that we could share and um, the whole person care uh, topic um, in the prime resources, there's materials there that you could fill up a whole day with uh, different aspects of whole person care, useful models and tools and things like that. Um, I'll just leave you now with this famous picture of the, um, perhaps from the Victorian era. We can see the mother despairing in the corner and the father behind that watching on. Uh, the doctor looking at the child perhaps has scarlet fever when there was no penicillin. Waiting for the fever to turn, just being there. So <clears throat> this um, picture is very evocative and uh, reminds us uh, of why we're in the healing profession. 1891. So a summary. We are continually mindful that every patient is a person made in God's image and we seek to treat each person with compassion, respect and dignity, understanding the supreme importance of the practitioner-patient relationship and more than that, uh, the teacher-student relationship. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Uh, I think we've managed to finish time.